Welcome back to Inside the Pastor Study Podcast. I'm Pastor Jeremy. And I'm Pastor George. And, or I guess, welcome to the yeah. Inside the Pastor Study Podcast. It has been so long since we've Ages. been able to be here in the studio doing a podcast that um, this you might be a new thing to you. Yeah. You might, yeah, I just spent the, I, we've started and stopped this more than once. I had to remember all my buttons. Um, it was, a, you know, it was a little bit of an adventure in here. So for some of you who were like, what is this podcast that's just shown up on my, uh, my feed? I don't seem to remember this one. Hey, how's it going? I'm Pastor Jeremy. And, and I'm uh, Pastor George. <laughs> we're a father and son pastoral team serving uh, the local church uh, in Methuen, Massachusetts. And uh, we're glad you're here with us. And it's good to be back again in the studio. Um, a little treat for those of you who are tuning into our um, our video podcast that is happening you know, yes, on YouTube. Treat, yes. Uh, and uh, Spotify also. You can catch the, the uh, video podcast on there. I'm currently running a poll in on social media and in my house. Um, this may be the only day you get to see the uh, the mustache that I have at the moment. And for some of you, you've already switched over to the audio version and you can't even look at me. Um, I've been watching people like look at me all day and it's hilarious. I'm having a great time with this, but it's really just a chance to mess with my wife and the girls uh, at home. So yeah, so if you're seeing this, this may be the only time you ever see me with a mustache ever. And so it may actually drive our YouTube because people might be listening and then say, oh, Oh, I'm going to see this. I need to go see this. Yeah, we'll have a bump in, uh, we'll have a bump in views and they'll all be for like six seconds and then be gone. So thanks for the six seconds you tuned in to check it out. And uh, we're glad you're here with us. Um, we uh, we start off uh, every episode with a, a theological term of the week. It's a way for us to kind of um, dig into the vernacular that we as pastors use. Um, sometimes we just throw words out there that we are familiar with that other people have a bit of a hang up on. So let's get in and check out this week's theological term. The theological term of the week. This week's term is congregation. You might not think of that as a theological term, but we are going to throw out the word congregation and we're going to do a little compare and contrast term today. Yeah. Because, um, you know, we're, for those of you who have been with us, you know, for more than just this episode, and I, I recognize it's almost been a month since we've been in here. Um, but for those of us who, you know, if you remember all the way back to the last time we were on a podcast, we were working through uh, terms that are within the wing of ecclesiology, so the study of the church. And so we uh, we talked about some some of the offices of the church, you know, different leadership yes. roles and what their jobs are. We talked about some of the ordinances of the church. Those are the things that the church does. We've talked about um, some of the things that the church practices in their in their um, services, so like the liturgy of the church. So, so we we've talked liturgy, yeah, we did, we've yeah. talked a lot of these different terms in ecclesiology, mm-hmm. and so now we're we're getting into like who are the actual people showing up to church? What are the yeah? What, who are the people that make up the church? You know, you have all of those leaders, but who are who else? And right. what is their term? And so, right. congregation is the term that um, Protestantism has has used frequently. Yes. Does yeah. congregation exist as a term? Pre schism, ooh, schism's a word too, right? Yeah, that's a good. That's word. like a split, right? Yeah, like the, a, yeah, there, there right. are a couple of historic schisms or splits in the. And in some the people don't movement. know how to say schism. Yeah, it looks weird when you write it, it down. They look at it and they say it was a, a schism. schism. Shiz- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, but back to congregation. I, I think you come close in uh, Philippians one. Great, okay. you know, Paul and Timothy writing, and it says to the church Mm -hmm. that is in Philippi together with the elders and the deacons. And it almost sounds like you need a church or a congregation, an elder and deacon to make a church exist, right? But then you could say it it could be the parish because it's located within... Within a room. And that's the word we're going to contrast this morning. Yes. Is congregation versus parish. Right. Because I think for, Mm. for a lot of people, those are interchangeable. Yeah. Um, And and yet they aren't, but yes. And then there are, there are probably others who don't, you know, would just default to one of those words over the other, depending on their church background. Right. So I right. will have people that have come to our church from uh, a more uh, sacerdotal church. Mm, there's we, a word we used before, we, too. Yeah, yeah. So this kind of a test. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll talk to me about, you know, well, do the people of your parish do X, Y, or Z? Right. And uh, and it's kind of a cringe moment for me as as a good congregationalist mm-hmm. because the word parish means something totally different. So a congregation, it just means 
a gathering who are they are with one another gathered the the con word means with mm-hmm. and uh they gather with they, mm-hmm. so they that's the broadest temp broadest yeah. thing so, so yeah we've talked about i've used this term actually i've used this term a lot more post um covid return than maybe i've ever used in my um, ministry career. I, I, I talk about the gathered people of God. Yes. Um, yeah. right. As the church or the ecclesia, right. Yes, that word is term, another word yeah. too, right. Like yeah. is ecclesia. Yeah. yeah. So ecclesia and congregation are, they would be, would they be like synonyms? They are very close to synonyms. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you, you know, we, we talk, yeah, we're going to introduce all kinds of concepts this morning. Mm-hmm. Right? We talk local and universal when we talk about the church. Yeah. And uh, I think that there are like three times in the New Testament where the word church really means universal. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the times that it's used in the Bible, it means local. Yeah. So you're talking about a congregation. You're talking about a group of people who have been called out and they have gathered with one another. So they've come out of somewhere. That's Mm -hmm. the ecclesia part. They've come to something. Mm -hmm. And that's the congregation part. They've decided to gather together with one another. Yeah. So I I think that word is significant because it makes it clear that well God's church gathers. Mm. Mhm. They they're not they're not spread all over. They they gather. So as a congregational church we identify our gathering, our congregation as being significant. Now, we've mentioned the word parish. Mhm. And the parish more common with the sacerdotal concept more common with a with a church state concept hmm. oh yeah true true okay yeah uh, as a matter of fact um, in in the early in the early 17th century one of the struggles that the Church of England faced with the colonies here in the Americas was that they could not develop an accurate or adequate parish system hmm. Um, uh, American colonists were, were uh, scattered. They weren't going to, and they were going to go to church. This is interesting in the colonies. They were going to go to church where they wanted to go to church, not where the church of England would tell them that they had to go to church. So Hmm. the church of England tried, tried to implement a parish system in the colonies and the parish system of the, of the, uh, of the, um, Anglican Church failed miserably. Was unable to actually make it happen. We love to shop. We do absolutely. Well, <laughs> yeah, there is, love to there shop, is a right? truth to that. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> but uh, and that was, by the way, I mean, most people don't realize this, but in 1750, the uh, the Anglican Church had actually petitioned the king, King George the Third, mm-hmm. and the petition was for the re-Anglicization of the church in the American colonies. And the church was about to be the the uh, the church here in Massachusetts, which was primarily uh, Puritan and mm-hmm. congregational in its character, uh, was about to be put under a very strict discipline where they were going to be forced into uh, geographical locations called parishes, and the churches of uh, the Church of England was going to force itself into the colonies. And uh, it may have actually been right up there with the Stamp Act as to why the American Revolution came mm. into existence, mm-hmm. because Americans didn't want to be perished. Yeah. So that, um, I think historically that term has meant, yeah, has been that the larger organization of church um, has s- geographically split up its congregants into areas that make sense. And yes. so then you'll have like the you know our t- the town our church is in is Methuen so you would have the church of Methuen right that you would have a parish yeah, here in the Methuen. parish of Methuen and everybody would go to depending on the size of Methuen right we're a pretty large city right um right. but you would have like your your meeting house or your your church your 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 building that you would all go to because you lived in that parish exactly. right and you would have a priest assigned or a, maybe larger well like, more than yeah you so, have so to be a parish. Okay, the word parish comes from um, the Latin system of government, the mm-hmm. Roman system of government. So a parish was a the smallest, um, the smallest uh, administrative political district of the Roman 
of the Roman government. Hmm. So mm -hmm. they would establish a parish, and over the parish, they would put an episcopus, mm -hmm. otherwise known as a bishop. Mm -hmm. So technically, the parishes in the Roman Catholic Church around the world, if you have a parish, you need to have a bishop mm. because a bishop oversees a parish. Mm -hmm. So wherever, I don't know our area's Roman Catholic uh, community that well, um, but there might be, there actually could be four or five churches, Roman churches within a parish all under a bishop. I see. Yeah. Okay. So that the parish may, may you know, and that, that, it com that covers a lot of cultural issues too. I mean, when I was a kid, there was a, there was an Italian Catholic church in my area and there was a, an Irish Catholic church in my area. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had a friend of mine when we lived in New Jersey uh, 15 years ago, I, I remember talking with the uh, the principal of the high school and he was complaining to me this is this is pretty pretty precious he was complaining to me that uh, the local the local catholic church in our town was largely a polish catholic church mm -hmm. wasn't he polish he was very very polish yeah he was very unhappy because the only priest that they could find to oversee this polish catholic church was a man from the Philippines hmm. who actually didn't even speak English well and didn't understand Polish Polish culture well. Huh. So he was struggling because they had he was he would he just flat out complained to me. He said, <laughs> he said couldn't figure out why why they couldn't find somebody who was Polish to come and oversee a Polish church. Huh. You know, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you have parishes, and the parishes is is. is geographic mm -hmm. in nature and it's under a bishop hmm. and those those are key ingredients to that so you don't have the opportunity within a parish structure well, maybe maybe right you maybe do. you choose the cat the the um the italian church over the uh, irish church so those two churches would still be within the same parish yes those okay. ch two churches would still be within the same parish but um, you know it's not necessarily that uh you know if you lived in Methuen and you wanted to and my my Catholic friends may change may confront me about this, but you know if you lived in Methuen, you might you might want to travel down to uh, to Waltham, mm -hmm. which is a town about fifteen miles away from here. Maybe that's your parish. Maybe that's where you want to worship, but that's not where under a parish system you would be enabled to or allowed to worship. Right, they would so not you... want you to change. Churches, right? If you wanted to have your kids baptized or Absolutely. confirmed, or you wanted to get married, you are going to get married in your parish church, in your local congregation, mm -hmm. or in your local, yeah, your local within your parish. Yeah, and then area. you would choose. Yeah, okay, right. interesting. So, right. so there would be congregations. Theoretically, there are congregations within the parishes. Yes. Yeah, there are. Just right. to kind of throw those words back into the same sentence again. Right. But a lot of people think of parish, and it's it's it. Yeah. Right. So, so what we've done culturally is we've kind of copied that, copied and pasted those words over each other. Right. Or find replace. I'm trying to remember my actual computer yeah, term. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you, uh, so there are people who come from a parish type system who would then come into maybe a, a congregational system, and they would refer, they would use that word parish to refer to their congregation, and you know, which is why sometimes there's correction, and other times yes. there's just there's just grace. Yeah. Right. But you're like. Oh, a lot We're of a congregation, yeah. but yes, that's us, right? But so here's another aspect of congregationalism. Mm -hmm. All right, because you're in, in congregationalism, your congregation isn't limited by geography, right? Yeah, and I've seen a lot of churches where this goes the other way. Like in our church here, um, I mean, we our address is Methuen. Yes, but we pull from a lot of regions. Yes, we do, and you know, and in multiple states. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, and, in, and sometimes, you know, there are even people who come over from Maine, right? Who, yeah, so we have like up true. to three states that yeah. we'd be pulling from on a Sunday. Yeah. And people drive past good churches. Yeah, great churches. To get here. Yeah. Um, I was meeting with a family. They had just um, did a funeral family recently, right? And they're talking about um, that the mother had passed away. And, and I was talking with the son about her, their early decision to come to our church, even though they lived in the town of Amesbury. The time, which is mm. 
quite a hike from quite us, a dr- right? Yes. That's, that's, a, that's a long drive back and forth on a Sunday morning. And there are great churches over in that area, um, but they had some connections here and there were some programs here that made Marsh Corner unique at the time that they thought were valuable. And so they made that trip for years and years and years. Um, and so, yeah, so we still have that regional connection. Not all, not all congregational churches do, but because of our location and our culture that, that works well here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I know of other churches like, you know, my brother's church, right? It lives um, near a major city in the Midwest. And they're a classic conservative uh, congregational type mega church. And they've actually reframed the parish idea. I think um, the opposite way. And so they will, within their very large congregation, they recognize that there are regions and clusters of people within that congregation. And so they've, they've taken the parish term and they, they will use that as ways to help um, make sure that each of those people groups uh, are properly ministered to because in a large church, you need to be really careful about that kind of like administrative work. And so they will have, you know, different parishes and then they'll have deacons who are, who are involved in those parishes particularly. And they'll have like, you know, I think they'll do like different small groups and like, you'll, you'll find small groups within your parish. Cause that makes sense. And you don't have right. to travel as far. And so they'll just, they've taken that term as a geographical term for how their, how their large regional church is used and help to break that out administratively yeah. so whereas we just have small groups that tend to be geographically right located, because we're, we don't necessarily have a deacon or an elder who's, who's overseeing over that, that region region right yeah, yeah. right it technically wouldn't be a parish if you didn't have an elder overseeing the region i think they do they actually yeah, do have they do have like the pastor of that particular region they actually i think they have like a pastor over that region they also would have like an executive pastor over that region working in that region yeah. as well yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting. Yeah. So they've thing. gone to a parish structure, which again, mm-hmm. you right. can you do a lot have, of things like within the parish. Yeah, right, right. But the parish in in many in most churches, when you use the word parish, you're right. looking at right. This is a creative reterming, I think. Exactly right. right. Yeah, but right. by and large, when you're interacting with these terms, which is it's actually kind of a cool thing, right? When you know theology really well, you get to paint with it. Yes. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, we did, you did this years ago, it's it my idea, but you did this years ago in your previous church where- With the Levite concept? Yeah, you, yeah. you had, yeah. Um, yeah, your your trustee board, you know, typically a trustee board are all the guys who gather together and paint stuff and fix stuff that breaks. And uh, you, we'd returned that like to be Levites because that yes. goes back to like that, that role that in the- the role in the Old Testament. Yeah. They, painted stuff and they, yeah, they were there. They were there Actually, for the upkeep and I, the administration of worship, right? I love the idea of, you know, the Levites were there for uh, opening and closing the doors. I mean, one of the things we struggled with at that church was who was going <laughs> to be there unlock. on Sunday morning to unlock the doors and who's going to lock it up at the end of the night, at the end of the day. And, yeah. You know, if you were a Levite, that meant that you were a key holder mm, and that you mm-hmm. had to had the responsibility of locking the place up at the day, yeah. end of the day. See, so when you know your theology, you can, you you can, can play, play with some yes. of these things. Um, that's part of the, that's part of the piece. That's part of the thing here, right? In in our heart in this podcast, as a, you know, why we give this segment so much time every week is or every month is you know the more the more that um, as often as you meet the yeah, podcast, right? the more uh, the more that you who are listening can interact with these biblical terms and think biblically about everything in your world. I yeah. think the better off we all are, and so we're hoping to kind of increase that literacy. That's our that's our goal. Yeah. So yeah. that congregation and parish, hopefully, uh, I think you think hopefully we covered we've these? handled that. I think yeah. so. Yeah. All right. So if you have any more questions, you know, podcast at marshcorner dot com, and uh, well, we might respond. We may. Yeah, we'd love to. <laughs> All right. That's our theological term of the week. The theological term of the week. As we uh, just went to that clip, I looked up at our monitor again, and I had to laugh at the. Mustache, mustache again yeah. it's hilarious yeah. anyway um <laughs> i'm reading a book right now um oh good I, you got to do that once in a while yes it's part of the job description and uh, no I, I love to read and i've i've dug into a book that has been sitting on my shelf for a little while and i picked up and i'm really enjoying it um i had to go back and actually write down the title because anyone's going to talk about it here but um it's written by an author a pastor who, out of kansas named tom nelson and uh um the book is called the economics of brotherly love Interesting. Um, and the, the premise of the book is um, that 
I think, you know, I think the premise of the book is, yeah, the premise of the book is that as like Christians, our job on this earth is not just Sunday to Sunday, that we also need to continue to be Christians Monday through Friday in our workplaces. Right. And, you know, and so his thinking is how do you bridge that gap between Sunday to Monday? And he has several books in this, in this, in this wing and, um, and even like an organization called Made to Flourish, which is interesting. Cool. Um, but, you know, connecting <clears throat> Monday to Sunday. And so, but what he thinks he's talking about in that is how do, how do we think biblically or Christianly about our work and, uh, and what we do with our work? And, um, mm. and I've really appreciated this. And he's talking about, you know, there's a lot of economics, obviously, in this book. And I think economics is a fascinating conversation. And I also, I think it's fascinating that, also that a lot of Christians hide from this conversation. Yeah. Well. Um, it's, you know, we, there are, you know, in our heads, I think for the average Christian or even the average observer of Christians, there are two types of Christians who think about money and economics. There are the prosperity gospel people who, if you'll just, you know, send me a new jet every five years to replace my old jet, then my ministry will continue to flourish and people will come to know Jesus. And God will bless you. And God will bless you. Financial need. Yeah. And if you're not seeing financial gain and prosperity in your world, then that may be an indication that you're out of line with the Lord. Like, you know, financial prosperity is a is a marker. sign or a marker of your of your holiness. Right. right? Yeah. I've seen that. And so that's that. yeah. yeah, that's something that we reject. Right. Yes. Um and an equal and, and another thing that like you see, depending on what's going on culturally, um within within the church is the the the, the poverty economics, right? Like yeah. the poverty Christianity that right. that God only really like all, the only really spiritual ones in this world are the ones the who poor who are poor, right. right? Blessed are the poor. Right. And, um, and so we will, like I, when I was in college, <laughs> there was a, uh, he's kind of fallen out of prominence, but he was really popular back when I was in college as an author named Shane Claiborne. And he, they lived like, he had this like intentional community in Philadelphia and they, um, were basically trying to live into this, uh, what, maybe a misinterpretation of what's going on in acts where everybody has sold all of their stuff and they're okay. living it together. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so they would live basically in these Christian communes where everything was shared and, mm. and they would pers- in a sense, pursue poverty. So even as he would write books and sell millions and millions of books, like all of that money, um, as far as I can tell, was funneled back out into um, social justice movements and poverty, poverty work. And, um, he really kept enough to keep the commune that he lived in alive and healthy, right? Mm, interesting. And um, again, like you, you see stuff like that, and I think like I understand like some value in this, but I also don't see scripturally how that that's our call. Like that, I don't think that like you yeah. are more holy if you choose if you're pov- if you're impoverished. Yeah, and you, um, I mean to some extent you see that with um, Quaker theology mm, mm-hmm. and. Um, the uh, the uh, spiritual discipline of simplicity, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which very close to in some ways the concept of this of that idea of living living poverty, living living only with what you need and not with anything more. Um, yeah, you get that with John Wesley too, right? Doesn't John you, Wesley you like do get he to... lives on the same minimal, as far as we know, right? Yeah. He lives on the same minimal amount of money the entire time of his ministry, and right. even as he made more, he just gave it all away. There, there's even some of that in some of the early Puritans, and yet the Puritans, Puritans were quite wealthy, mm-hmm. um, but they there was a uh, you know there was there was a rejection of wealth. Mm. So yeah, there's there's some of that poverty gospel, and it, we're afraid of money. We're, we're yeah, just damn right afraid of that. money. Right. It's, we're, we're, we're much more comfortable talking about um, everything else. Yes. <laughs> in faith. Like, yep. we, we will hit, I think, I, 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 pastors will hit politics and sexual ethics before they'll hit money. Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, because it's just, it becomes a third rail, which is interesting because sure. Jesus talks about money constantly. All the time. All the time. And, and the scriptures talk about economics all the time. And so as I'm reading this book, there are a few illustrations that point that stuck out to me of interest. Uh, um, the one is, you know, he, he's talking about Jesus's um, parable of the Good Samaritan. And, you know, we're, we're, 
if, you, if you've actually found this podcast, you're probably pretty familiar with this parable. Um, but so you know, the Gospel of Luke, yeah, in case you're looking, Jesus is, um, you know, talking about who is my neighbor. Somebody's confronted Jesus, who's my neighbor, and so Jesus comes up with uh, this illustrative story and talks about a man who's made a dangerous trip. He gets beaten up by robbers and um, several people who were pillars in the faith community walk by this man and don't help him. Right. Um, whether that's to maintain ritual purity or just they're cold and they're, they're hypocritical. And the person who does stop to care for um, the wounded man is a Samaritan who is um, an ethnic um, abomination or outcast yeah, among the Jews. Yeah. And so this outcast, um, Jesus says, which of these is treated, you know, which of these was the neighbor to the man who's been wounded? And then the, the crowd is forced to admit that it's this outcast who has been the neighbor. But part of the story is that that man picks up this wounded, that Samaritan picks up this wounded man, brings him to an innkeeper, says, gives him money, says, take care of his needs, and basically plops the credit card down on the table and says, and charge everything else to my account for whatever his care is going to be right. um, until he's nursed back to health. And, and Nelson in his book is arguing like, that person had to have some substance. Th yes, that person he did. had to have had some economic success um, in order to be able to afford to care for that person who had been broken and wounded. And that, you know, the, and he moves on to say, like, success is not something for Christians to run from. It's something that, it's a tool that God has given us to leverage for the good of the world. Right. Um, right. And that's really the premise. Like, economics are a tool that God has given um, that Christians should be using to leverage for the common good. Yes. And, um, yeah, and I think it's an interesting premise. I think it's interesting yeah. to work about it. The second illustration, and then I'll let you weigh in on the economics piece here. Okay. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll start with these two as like orienting ideas. So you have the good Samaritan who uses his economic advantage to help. Um, and then the second one, he goes to, he goes and talks about Adam and Eve and God's command to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And, he, and have dominion and ha over it. Or have dominion over it. So yeah. do it, have dominion over it, right? I think those are the two, those those are um, translative differences, right? Right. Um, so um, the premise that he's taking, the author of this book is taking is like, you know, when we um, read that, we say, aha, woman's job is to make babies. And obviously men's are, men are involved in that process. Yeah. And if you have questions, you can talk to your parents. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the job, you know, part of humanity's job is to have babies. And that's what it means to be fruitful and multiply. You're going to have children who are then going to have children. And as a people, you will multiply and you will fill the earth up because there will be people everywhere. We've always taken that fill the earth, multiply and subdue it only, I think, for most of us, only as a childbearing command. And well, anyway, um, but his illustration, go right? Ahead. That's his illustration, and I would say, like, I, I I know you're reacting to that, but I would think, like, in as I've grown up and as I've gone through Bible college, as I've gone through seminaries, I've spent time interacting with people in church. I think that most people, when they interact with that phrase, that command of God, are only thinking of children. Interesting. Okay. And and so Nelson is saying this is not just a children command. It is a children command. But it's not just a children command. No. And he's saying that there are probably a lot of women over history who, you know, when they are not able to have children or, you know, couples, when they are not able to have children, feel that they are no longer part of God's dominion or work in the world. Like there, there's a defeat there. Like all my only job in this world, you know, according to God at the very beginning is to fill the earth and sub and put it under dominion. And then my, jo my job under Jesus is to make disciples and baptize. So I guess that's what I can do. Cause I can't do the dominion piece. And that's uh, odd. Okay. And all right. he would say his, his thing is like, you know, also part of what we do is multiplication effort is kind of what, you know, that the parable Jesus uses later with talents, like God's given us talents. You can either bury those and you can do nothing with them, or you can leverage those talents, those things right. that God has gone, done, given you, so that the leveraged talents multiply and are used to expand the kingdom. Right. So those are these two economic ideas. All right. All right. All all right. right. So you're already interact. You're already like reacting harshly against. I, I am the child cause, thing. Because here's the thing, right? I, I I see the child part. But it's it's the end that he's missing. It's like and it's the fill the earth and subdue it. 
and have dominion. Over. So I, I see as this necessity of having children. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't see that as a woman's job. It's a, it's a, it's a both, right? Right. It's a both. I think people, it's a both yeah. end, right? I, I don't see w- woman's, a woman's job is not to have babies. Agreed. Okay. A woman's job is to participate in the dominion of this world by having by having children. That's mm-hmm. part of it. But also, see, I'm a I'm an exploiter. Mm-hmm. I believe that that phrase, you know, have to, to subdue and have dominion over the earth, it is a is a statement about our need to exploit the resources that God has given us in this world. Yes. So, as long as we're having babies. Husbands and wives raising children together, filling the earth, subduing. We are to use the resources that we have in our world to honor and glorify God. We're sp- to exploit them, to pull them out, and to use them. So, um, I I agree in this sense that uh, all of us are all of us are viceroys. All of us are called to subdue the earth, men and women. We're to labor together. And to use what God's given us, so mm-hmm. let's use it. Um, I like I like his reference to uh, to the Samaritan and his wealth, mm-hmm. um, because you know obviously he does have the money to actually make a difference, right? And I think that there's a sig- it, he has the money to make the make a difference, and there's no obligation other than the fact that he sees someone overcome. Yeah. For him to use his for him to use his wealth, mm-hmm. but he still does. So here's the thing, right? You can't help somebody if you don't have it. Right, right. And I think ultimately, that's this is kind of and I, a big piece of this conversation. I right? see that kind of part of the conversation. And um, and so I guess the encouragement from that that premise is that Christians should be careful with what they're given and careful to, I guess, exploit, exploit, to use your word, right? Yeah. Careful to exploit their resources and talents for the good of, of God's creation, right? That's sure. part of our, that's part of our dominion keeping role. Right. See, I, th- I see dominion keeping. Is so it's not just about like resources. It's, mm-hmm. um, I mean, when you use the word exploit and you use the word resources, I think one of the things you think of immediately in our culture is oil and gas. Yeah. Right? Um, there's lots of oil and gas. Mm-hmm. And I remember about the time that I was in uh, college, uh, there was a lot of conversation about um, – th- there was a new conversation that had come out within the decade about something called peak oil. Mm. Now, I lived through the Jimmy Carter – um, um, oil and gas shortage, mm-hmm. and the conversation was: We I feel only like have, I have two now. Yeah, see, <laughs> we only have so much oil and gas to go around, and pretty soon it's all going to be gone. And, mm. and there was this conversation about: You know, we have we have another five to ten years, and then we will have hit peak oil, and then from that point on, the the oil resources are going we're to just be, gonna be draining the well. We're just going to be draining the well, and yeah. there's no more of it. There's never going to be any more of it made, kind of a thing. And then they find more of it. I mean, at the moment, because of exploitation, and I'm going to come back to that, because of exploration and exploitation, we've discovered more and more oil, and it's no longer a conversation about peak oil. Mm. But here's the thing that makes exploitation possible, and that is we're not only exploiting Earth's resources, we're also exploiting our creative, imaginative cognitive resources that God has given to us. Yeah. And this, so this is an illustration he hits also in the book. You're reminding me of this. Like, you, so the, that, um, that first piece you're talking about, like there's only so much oil and then we're going to run out. Yeah. Is uh, illustrative of a, um, a, a economic worldview. Yes. That is very popular and yes. has been for some time. And you've probably, people have used this. It's called zero sum game. Z- zero sum game. And that is like, if you take a pie, that pie is not, it, that just is the pie. Like that pie contains all of the pie that you get. Yes. And so if I get a very large slice of pie by my good fortune or upbringing or um, decisions or perhaps my, you know, history or whatever, then that means by necessity, other people's pie slices will be smaller. 
Yeah, right. That's, that's the zero and, sum gain idea. Yeah, and a zero sum. So, and that happens. That 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 rhetoric exists in our world frequently, right? Like, you know, we should soak the rich because you know they have more than their fair share of the pie, and we need you know uh, because they're so wealthy, all of these other people are being exploited, right? Yes. Uh, they're being used, um, but we use that word exploit in you know the negative connotation, right? Right. Um, yeah. They're being exploited, and therefore, you know, they can't get a leg up in this world because their slice of pie is so small. Um, but the 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 opposite view of this that there's only one pie, there's zero sum, that only that all that exists is all that will exist is is different than this economic principle you're just talking exactly. about. Exactly, because where we can we use, make more pies, we can make more pies, right? Let's make more pies. And we see this actually play out a lot in our world. And we've watched this happen over the lot, you know, in my lifetime, a lot, frequently. Yeah. Um, in, uh, see, I'm born in the mid 1980s. By the time I'm born, um, computers are still pretty big. They run on tape. Uh, they fill, you know, they fill large rooms. rooms. And not too long after I'm born, you've got people who are able to, with their creative ingenuity and with advancement in technology, move those computers from being the size of a room to the size of a garage, and then even smaller. And you can actually make these little, make them in these little wooden boxes, and you can send those out. And for what two, three thousand dollars, which is an astronomical amount of money at the time, yes, um, for two, three thousand dollars, anybody could buy a computer and do some basic work in their house with it. Pretty crazy. And. The creation of the computer and moving from tape to microchip expands yeah. the. You miss floppy disk in the right, middle. Right, right, right. Yeah. Expands the economy in such a rapid way that now there are so many more pies that exist. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, if you go back to 1960 and say, "Hey, like my buddy just made like 10 million dollars because he bought Bitcoin when it was low," right. Right, right, exactly. That's like not that 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 is a it does not compute, right? Yeah. That but but there is a whole and that's that you know the cryptocurrency whether it's up or down or whatever it is at right now, right? Potentially a new pie for, for wealth yes. creation that comes yes. out of creativity, our ingenuity, and our understanding of technology and where we're going, right? And now yes. like explosion in wealth and yeah. retraction of wealth recently, but like you have like the the economic industry like people you know our industrious nature creates more pies all the time all the time and that's god that's that is god's image in us and us actually doing what god told us to do to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it mm -hmm. that's every time um every time somebody invents a new way of doing something that makes life easier faster uh, more economical they're acting in God's image in this world, and they're actually doing what God told them to do. Yeah. When I was eight years old, there was a doctor in South Africa named Christian Barnard. Mm -hmm. And he was in South Africa because what he wanted to do was illegal in most, of, in most European countries and in the United States. What, what Dr. Barnard wanted to do and what he perfected was he wanted to take a heart out of somebody who's whose organs had stopped and take that living heart from a dead person and put it into somebody whose heart was failing. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I was eight years old, um, third grade, I remember Christian Barnard doing his very first heart transplant. And the individual that he transplanted that heart to lived for about three days. Mm. And it was an amazing, amazing moment. He had done a complete, he had taken a heart from somebody who had died in an automobile accident. Mm -hmm. They were able to transition it over and put it in this man's chest and he lived for three hours. Days. And, three days? Three, three days. Hours. Three yeah. days. Right? Yeah. Nowadays, heart transplants are common. Common. Yeah. Super common. I had an uncle when I was, I had an uncle when I was 10. So that's like two, two years later. Heart problem because the uh, the arteries going into his heart had clogged, and they uh, they did this massive surgery that took like eight or ten hours. They they actually had to cut his sternum and break open his chest, and they replaced these arteries with arteries from his legs. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was one of the first 
um, quadruple bypass heart patients. Mm. And he was in the hospital for weeks after that. Mm. Nowadays, nowadays, those are very common, those heart surgeries. And they're not, ri- they're not as, I'm sure they're as risky, but they've, they've perfected it. They know what they're doing. Yeah. And they don't even need to do that, right? They can actually pass a catheter through your, through your groin and arteries. in and yeah. boom, figure it all out. My point here is all of that, all of that makes life easier, better, and actually prolongs life mm-hmm. because we're exploiting our knowledge and our ability. And yeah, even for Dr. Barnard, there probably was the exploitation of a dead body. Mm. And who knows what he had done before that moment of that surgery back in 1968 that enabled him to actually perform it. Where did he practice that? Mm. How did he figure it out? Mm -hmm. How did he make that work? My point is, my point is that all of that works into this concept of economics Mm. in that if I, there's always more, there's always better there's always this stuff that we can we can exploit, create, imagine, develop that will make life better, easier, and happier. Yeah. Um, it's just it's a matter of it's a matter. The pie is not a single pie. Right. Because yeah, anytime there's a new industry, you create a new pie, and and even within that, right? Every time you have a new idea within an industry, you're creating new pies. New so pies. You're creating new opportunities for people to work. Like, Absolutely. You know, um, the richest man in the world, I think, at the moment is a guy who is making something that um, nobody wanted to buy right. 15 years ago. Right. He bought it for 70 bucks. Yeah. Um, and that's that there are, you know, how many people have a job? Um, a lot of people have lost their jobs because of him, but how many people have a job sure. because sure. of that, um, sure. that expansion or that new pie that exists, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, well, look at Henry Ford. Yeah. Okay. When, when Henry Ford developed the, the Model T, everybody mm-hmm. complained because he was going to put buggy whip manufacturers out of business. Mm-hmm. He probably did. Yeah, he did. I mean, <laughs> you know. They're, they're probably still like yeah, one Yeah, there's left. somebody somebody probably in like, you know, some, uh, some um, artistic recreation place that actually knows how to make buggy whips. But mm-hmm. he, he put buggy whip people out of business. But, you know, one of the things that made... Uh, Henry Ford, amazing. The other people had made automobiles before him, mm-hmm. and other people had assembly lines before him. He made he made an automobile that was purchasable by the people who were working on his assembly line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's that that's what made him different. Mm-hmm. So his concept, yeah, it did put buggy whip manufacturers out of business, but he he gave them a new job. Right. He got a, they got a new work, and and that's the thing is that there's. There's a group of people in our culture, in the world, the term was, the term was first uh, coined back when uh, the start of the Industrial Revolution in the 1830s are called Luddites. Mm-hmm. They were individuals who will always oppose new ideas and new creat- creativities and new concepts of economics, mm-hmm. new product, if you will. Christians should never be Luddites. Hmm. Yeah, because we're, what we're, I guess what we're talking about is like, it's our kind of responsibility to be part of this creative process. Absolutely. Right. And, um, and one of the things that I've taken from my undergrad that is just, it's stuck with me. And I use this, I talk about this all the time. Remember the, prof- the uh, president, he retired after my freshman year, but the president of the university talking about how Christians should be the best at. Yes. Right. And you know, that was kind of his, his thing, like, you know. Because Jesus is in us, Christians should be the best doctors. Because Jesus is in us, Christians should be the best lawyers. Christians should be the best actors. Christians should be the best musicians. Because um, uh, of all of you know, all of all the people contributing to the world, like those of us who actually know the Creator and ha- are inhabited by the Holy Spirit, should be able to improve the world there that they are choosing to work yes, in. Yes, right? absolutely. Like we are working yep. for the flourishing of all humanity, and the. Part of our role as as lovers of Jesus is to improve the environment that He's put us in, um, to fill the earth and to subdue, subdue it and yeah. have dominion, have dominion over, over it, right? It. 
And that, that's a that's a big piece of what we're called to do. So if you're a computer programmer, be the best. Right. Um, and if you're if you're an entrepreneur, like come up with something that is going to serve the world well, uh, and that will you know make a make an economic impact for you and those who work for you, but also because you know and love Jesus, like in, invent stuff that's going to like improve the livelihood and the lives of of people who don't know Jesus yet. Sure, right. Sure. Like we're we're playing this part in the econ- in the uh, the economy that we've been placed in. And I think, our, you know, when, as a response to the gospel, we should be making our sectors better. So this is one of those things. I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go do some Americentrism here because mm-hmm. I think that going back to what we've talked about years, you know, early episodes, I think that the evangelical bent of the United States, the the Great Awakening bent of our nation, has created a new way of thinking in the in our country that doesn't exist in other places it's it's mm. that evangelical christian influence that makes us more capable of filling the earth and subduing it here's the deal right one of the geniuses of that evangelical issue in the united states is that we may not be the first or the best one of the things that we can do is we can make Whatever, we can put our hand to things and make it available to everyone. Mm-hmm. Two cases. We've already talked about Henry Ford, mm-hmm. right? That's a, that is a, that is a Christian concept of filling the earth and, and subduing it. Other people had cars. There was the Mercedes Benz. There was uh, there were all kinds of vehicles like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Henry Ford makes it economical and capable for everyone. Um, Milton Hershey. Mm, yeah, there's another one. Yeah, you totally. know, uh, Milton Hershey, um, chocolate in Milton Hershey's day is reserved for the rich. Mm-hmm. The chocolate bar, the chocolate candy, it's reserved for the rich. And none of the chocolate makers of Europe will actually let out how they make chocolate. So Hershey has to pioneer there because his objective is to make chocolate for the masses. And to make chocolate that everybody can have, right? So I, I think one. And of then, the, but from that, like this is the this is the other circle. This is the other piece of the circle, right? From there, he also does incredible things for people with his wealth, right? Amazing. Like he yes. starts, you know, he has an orphanage. Um, he starts the Milton Hershey School. Yes. Um, which is really cool. I mean, still did this yeah, day. Yeah, still exists, right? Like, and that's you know, kids can get you know they I. Kim and I were flipping through the channels the other day because I had to because our internet was out. And so we were stuck with just old school channel flipping. And we came across a uh, an old episode of To Tell the Truth. And it was, um, you know, it was one of the Hershey children who was on there. And the panelists, this is like the 1970s, the panelists are all asking like all of these detailed questions about like the Milton Hershey school and, and the, and the, uh, um, Penn State has a, a huge um, a research hospital that yes. that Hershey bought and paid for and gave to the state of Pennsylvania. Yes, yes. Um, and all of that wealth came out of that. And like in the Milton Hershey School takes kids. Um, a lot, many of the kids who are part of that school either are, are either um, orphaned or come from broken homes. Yeah, and it's a high end private type school. Totally. Yes. That that these kids are given full scholarships to go to. And, you know, when you graduate, you get a suit of clothing and like, and money uh, to go start your job. Right. right. And, like all those right. things came out of, a, you know, this guy's, this, this guy's good idea to democratize chocolate. Yes. And because of his love for Jesus, he took all of that wealth and blessed people. Right. Yeah, exactly. He could live. Exactly. He could live. He, he, he was well taken care of. His yes. family was well taken care of. Incredibly wealthy family. Yeah. Um, um But, they didn't just sit on the wealth because of their love for Jesus. They leveraged their economic yeah. advantage yeah. for the blessing of others. Yeah. So, so here's the thing right now, there is somebody out there and I, I got to believe it's a Christian who could, who could take this really expensive concept of solar power and solar panels, which here's mm, the thing. Mm-hmm. Solar electricity is a boondoggle right now. I'll mm-hmm. tell you flat out, it is a boondoggle. That panel is going to deteriorate. It's filled with expensive parts. It's hard to manufacture. 
It's expensive to put up, and it doesn't produce what people say it's going to produce. What we need is a believer, a somebody who's best at what they do, mm -hmm. to come alongside of that whole concept of solar power and say, how do we make this real? I'll tell you right how now. How to make it viable. How right to now. make it viable. Because, because that's, that's, what this, that's this concept from the Good Samaritan. That's this concept of filling the earth and subduing it. It's not just that you can make it. Can you make it so that everybody can enjoy it? Mm -hmm. Can you make it and democratize it? And, and I, think, I think that's when you broaden the pie. That's, I think that's more, more about what Jesus calls us to do as everyday Christians. Yeah. My other favorite story of this, since we move out of the United States, for those who are yeah, okay. listening, who are right, but, you know, um, the Guinness family. Yes, right? another great story of this, right? Like, right, right. The Guinness family. They they um, during the Wesleyan revivals, they come to know Jesus, and um, as they're looking around Britain, like one of the biggest, the big travesties of their day, they believe at the time is the overconsumption of gin and whiskey and 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 alcoholism. Um, but you know, at the time also, you know, there's still some value in like having a beer and it, and there's probably even some safety over the water supply and having a beer. And so he, well, there's also a malnutrition, and, issue. right. And a malnutrition issue. So he needs, he sees all the, that's right. The malnutrition is also an issue. And so he sees all of these problems. And so he develops a low alcohol content beer that is highly fortified with iron and has other, um, nutrients in it that the malnourished society around him needed. And he started producing the Guinness beer. And it, you know, still obviously very popular. We just came out of March when it's most popular. Um, but that drink, you know, when he started becoming exceptionally wealthy with that, that idea, which came out of, right, uh, a, um, an economic, a, a gospel soaked economic worldview. Right. Right. Here is a problem that our society has. Here is my creative solution to fix it. Um, when he was blessed with the wealth off of that, he like turned and leveraged that wealth for the continued blessing of people around him. I was just looking up this quote and I wanted to get it right. Said, um, he said, you cannot make money from people unless you are willing for people to make money from you. And, you know, this is before the Great Depression, like late, you know, the 1920s. Um, he does things for the people who work for him. Like um, all of his employees have access to 24 hour medical care. All of his employees have access to 24 hour dental care. They even have on site massage therapy. Um, your funeral expenses and your pension were paid for by the company. Your education, as well as your children's and wife's education, were all paid for. And the company had libraries, reading rooms, athletic facilities, and so on. Um, and all of these things he said were, you know, he, he paid for his, he would shut down his factory for two weeks in the summer and pay for his employees to go on vacation. Um, all that of these amazing, things, actually. you know, none of the, these are all revolutionary. No yes. one has medical plans. No one has pension plans. None of these things exist. No one and, took vacations prior to World yeah. War II, which was pretty impressive. And so all of these things that now like we negotiate into our like pay packages and, you know, and we would never think of working in a career that doesn't have these perks are things that a believer right. invented in order to bless the people that or economically blessing him. Yes. Right. Yeah. And and I think that's you know my concern. Like we talk about money, and we talk about it with some trepidation and some fear. And I think that as people who know and love Jesus, our job is to leverage the things that God has put in before us. Um, view the world with a heart with the heart of Christ, and do our very best to promote the flourishing of the people who are around us. Sure. Absolutely. Um, yep, absolutely. And I think that's our calling and our role and our blessing. Because we're exploiting the world for Christ. Yeah. It's what he gave us. He wants us to use it. Yeah. So yeah. If you're listening to this. If you have, an, you have great ideas for the world and how to, how to change it or bless it, you, have an, you know, go pursue that with all of your heart, with all of your might, um, and uh, serve the Lord well with the increase. And uh, I think that's a way that Christians can have a have a an impact on the betterment of the world that we're in. Right. Um, if you see a problem in the world and you're frustrated with something that's going on, that the the solution is to bring Jesus into that environment 
and create something because we're all you know made in his image as creators create something that fixes the problem absolutely and see if god doesn't bless it perfect well we're blessed that you have found our podcast and listened once in again once again thanks we'll try and come back again you know we, we will we'll, we'll try not to make this another month although there's some work going on here at the church in the next week or oh, so, my, so yes. yeah we'll see yes. But we'll be back. We promise. We won't. This won't be our last episode. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Talk to you soon. You have been listening to Inside the Pastor Study podcast with pastors George and Jeremy Stevens. Artwork by Caitlin Gallagher. Music by San Demetrius. And engineering help from Ashley Gallagher. To find out more about us, head to Marsh Corner.